landscape architect from the Carlos Living and Work in California. He received a Bachelor of Landscape Architecture and a Master's degree in Urban and Regional Planning from the University of Florida. He also studied painting and drawing at the Art Student Stadium in New York City. In 1999, Chip was awarded the Rockefeller Foundation Fellowship at the Bellagio Study Center in Lake Como, Italy, and the Bogle Asco Fellowship in the Guarian Center for the Arts and Humanities in Genoa, Italy. He was a 1985 fellow in landscape architecture at the Academy, uh, American Academy of Rome. Chip Sullivan is the author of the popular drawing of the landscape book and co author of People in Landscape. His latest book, Garden in Climate, received the 2002 Award of Merit from the American Society of Landscape Architects. Sullivan has been working on a series of experimental gardens that reinforces the traditional garden and explores the potential of classical and historical landscape elements in contemporary passive energy applications. His drawings, box instructions, and garden level players illustrate the delicate balance between humans and nature and have been exhibited in galleries in New York City, throughout the United States, Canada, and the world. Chip has created a series of site specific installations about landscape and ecology and his experimental landscape designs have been exhibited in architecture and design school across North America. Articles by and about Mr. Sullivan have appeared in numerous publications, including Progressive Architecture, The Architectural Review, Art Forum, Art Design, and Landscape Architecture Magazine. He has taught at the Graduate School of Design at Harvard University and is presently an Associate Professor of Landscape Architecture at the University of California. Please come and welcome. Oops. I want to go back. Okay, now we're set. Okay, so I've got two cups of coffee here. I'm ready to go. I've come all the way from California. And uh, what I want to talk about tonight is this process of drawing. How I, how I use the creative process in my design theories. And I want to talk a little bit about uh, the experimental um, gardens that I've done, the installations, the ecological installations, and then I want to finish up with talking about uh, the historical gardens that are the basis of uh, the book Garden and Climate. To begin with, you know, this whole idea to me is the imagination. Where does the imagination come from? You know, for, for my generation, perhaps it was growing up with model railroads. You know, this idea of envisioning and projecting a model landscape. You know, this idea of the imagination, I think, is, is really critical to the design process. And, uh, you know, I was lucky enough to be of this generation where uh, you would, you know, like envision, envision what a landscape might look like. You know, you would, you would imagine yourself in it. You would actually shrink yourself down to the scale of being in the locomotive and going through these landscapes and seeing how they would, how they would work out. Now, how does an idea come about? You know, drawing to me is the, like the perfect form of representation because it's this immediate connection with the brain. You know, the brain and the eye. On the, on the drawing, on the illustration on the right, uh, I'm, I've sent my students out to do a, a gorilla installation, uh, illegal installation, and, but I'm sitting back with my binoculars and my cigar, you know, to make sure that I'm not going to get arrested. Uh, but they're, ta they're taking the chance. The drawing on the left is Leonardo's hand. Leonardo was left-handed. But he also drew with both hands. It, some say that he could write both directions and draw with both hands at once. I think that's something that really kind of enlivens this process of creativity. Now, the other thing that's important to me is this idea of observation, learning from the past, you know, being able to look and imagine. What happened with the sort of revolution of the architectural renaissance in, in Italy what happened with Brunelleschi. A Brunelleschi went to Rome with a shovel uh, a piece of paper, a pencil, and a measuring stick, and excavated the Roman ruins that were coming to light at the time. And his ability, you know, to excavate and imagine, to be able to imagine what the architecture would look like, allowed him to go back and create the, you know, the great Brunelleschi's great dome, one of the great pieces of, of uh, Renaissance architecture. That ability to imagine what's not there, you know, this process of going out into the landscape, measuring and imagining, I think was pretty important in his ability to, uh, you know, come up with new forms of architecture and landscape. Now, Leonardo da Vinci, let's see if I can figure out. 
Okay, okay, I got the What I like about Leonardo's work and what he exhibits to me is this process of multitasking with drawing. In the drawing process, here's he's working on the figure of the head, but at the same time he's envisioning this turret and the corner of this piece of architecture, which almost, almost repeats the sort of volumetric exercise of drawing the head. His ability to move around all at once between the page. So drawing allows this sort of change in scales where we can move back and forth. In this, in this image here, what he's doing in this study for a, a group of a group of figures, he set the models up in the center of the room, and this drawing actually shows that he was drawing around the space. He actually drew this drawing by moving 360 degrees. This ability, you know, to allow us to see into space. You know, here we have this sort of gear. He's working, you know, around the space. At the same time, he's drawing this gear. He's completing the image, and this sort of structure uh, of thinking you know, of drawing the figure not from the front but also from the back, this multiplicity of views that he was able to do, you know, to be able to envision in an om omnidirectional uh, viewpoint was really important and perhaps that's how Leonardo, more than any other artist, was able to capture the soul, I think before or since, he really was able to capture the soul of a human being in this drawing. And I think it, and I think it was that ability to see omnidirectionally, to actually to, to imagine the cavity inside of the brain, you know, to actually use x-ray eyes and go inside the figure to see how the, how the inside worked. And how fast do we draw? You know, we should really be able to sit down and draw quick enough to be able to capture this charging a rhinoceros, you know, and be able to draw it in that split second to imagine and being able to get that down on the piece of paper. Here, Eric Sloan, I'm going to try and figure out where the button is here. Eric Sloan, in imagining uh, these ancient sort of like machineries and trying to figure out how did they work by looking at different parts of the machines and then creating these drawings, he's visioning himself moving through the whole system. You know, he's, the great thing about drawing is it's envisioning the past, present, and the future. You can cross these boundaries of time as you move backwards and forwards. And all of his processes of drawings, of sort of recording the past that was disappearing really rapidly and trying to imagine how these things work, he was using drawing as a tool to work through those things. The beauty of Rube Goldberg's work, I think, really explains this idea of, of drawing and architecture and landscape architecture. This idea of making us believe the unbelievable. You know, drawing is a way that we convince ourselves that it can be done. Drawing is the way that we, we, we make people see that the buildings can stand up, that make, that make them see how the gardens can work together. For Rube Goldberg, for him, the unnecessary was the mother of invention by making this process as difficult as possible, uh, removing a gravy stain from your, from your, from your coat, you know, by, by making us go through that step by step, by looking at this animated process of how the landscape moves, which I think is important. We tend to view the landscape as a static moment in history. The landscape is alive, it's moving, it's in three dimension. How do we move through the landscape? You know, like, how can we, pr how can we project this image of landscape move movement? The animated landscapes of Walt Disney, I think, really project this idea of uh, envisioning. Here the animator is envisioning uh, like ten scenes, like almost a six-minute uh, short, animated short with Goofy, Mickey, and Donald, you know, putting this autom automobile together. The, fra the shot is framed. We're looking at how the action is worked. So in this one simple drawing, we're seeing this whole lapse of time, this whole movement of time, this whole sort of animated landscape as the figures move through it, activating the space. Here, this whole idea of anticipation. You know, humor lies in the anticipation. It's not so much Austin Powers drinking the cup of coffee. It's like knowing that he, he's going to drink the cup of coffee. It's just spreading that moment of anticipation out. You know, I mean, here we know that he's going to get hit on the head. He's trying to knock, you know, kill, the, kill the, uh, the mosquito. But this anticipation of time, this drawing, showing us the movement of the, uh, the mosquito, you know, at the same time showing us the movement of what's going to happen, this idea of using drawing to anticipate the future. You know, like putting yourself uh, ahead of time and how the, for the forward and backwards works. Now, one of the things that, that I love, uh, uh, this idea of the comic, here we see Windsor McKay's incredibly inventive uh, drawings for Little Nemo in Slumberland, which Little Nemo goes to, to sleep at night and he wakes up in this dream landscape. And this idea of activating the dream landscape and the design process, I think, is a pretty uh, interesting idea. And what, what we're doing is making, making the viewer believe that Little Nemo is actually in this space. And this whole idea of draftsmanship, of changing of scales, 
you know, is happening where the whole, this process of moving through space, you know, and, and this idea of flying above the landscape and seeing the landscape, you know, in this incredible three-dimensional quality. Now, um, Crazy Cat is perhaps, you know, one of the, the most beautifully drawn and thought out uh, existentialistic cartoons that's ever been done. The, the quality of the drawings were really beautiful, but the setup of the composition, you know, the way it tells a story, and there's this parallel between the development of the movie and the development of the comic. You know, that movies are done in panels and comics are done in panels. And this idea of the panel, which relates to the storyboard, is that you can read this image at once. You can comprehend the page as a whole. You can read it sequentially. You can read it from the back to the front. You know, you can pick out one image and look at it. But at the same time, it's this incredible composition. And uh, Crazy Cat existed in these incredibly surrealistic landscapes. It's probably one of the first uh, cartoonists to use this idea of surrealism in the landscape. Now, Jack Kirby, the master of the, the golden age of comics, took this idea of comic storytelling into a whole other dimension, where the page breakdowns, you know, where the, the picture frames begin to tell a story in themselves. The amount of the amount of motion, the amount of space within these frames, that the, this whole two-page spread is being used as a composition, where the, where the picture frames are framing the space. So it goes beyond this idea of the frame, but also this idea of using the shape of the frame to tell a story, so that this whole thing reads as a, a composition. And uh, Jack, uh, I mean, Steve Ditko, uh, the, uh, the actual inventor of um, Spider-Man comics, you know, and really didn't get much credit for it from Marvel, was the uh, creator of Doctor Strange. And this takes, this image takes us into a whole different realm of sort of the transcendental, of the cosmic, you know, where the, the cartoon frame is giving us this glimpse of another reality, where you're actually going through the doors of perception into this other reality and looking at the cosmos, you know, but yet at the same time exists on this flat plane uh, of information. Now, Art, Art Crumb, you know, the great underground cartoonist of the, uh, of the 60s, is doing something here that I think really portrays what we're trying to do in, in telling a story and relating the landscape. Here he's showing us the evolution of a landscape through time. It's like he puts us in a time machine and we can go backwards and forwards in time. Through this simple page panel, he's telling an incredibly horrendous ecological story of how the landscape moved. Through time slots, we can look at different, different select situations, decide where they were good, where they were bad, where they were transitioning, you know, where we ended up at. This, you know, drawing, you know, is this incredible time machine that goes forwards and backwards. And we can use this, you know, as a political statement or as a, an, you know, an environmental statement to see how the landscape is working. The beauty of com mixing, of, of comics, you know, is this mixing up of images, you know, that the, that the page is, is an incredible propaganda tool, you know, that it can be, you know, it can also, you can read the comic. It's a combination of word and image, you know, where they both have to work together or they both can work separately. This is Art Spiegelman, who's pretty much responsible for making that bridge between Mad Magazine and uh, the underground comic, and then taking the underground comic and turning it into an art form through Raw Magazine and others. Now, my mentor, uh, Frank James, takes this idea of the movie image and the idea of the storyboard and uses it to sort of develop the conceptual design where he would oftentimes start a project out with a, with a movie strip like this. And within these individual frames, he would develop the conceptual design. But it also allows, allows him to see the design as a total unit, you know, like the comic strip that can be read individually, and also move his eye through it to see how this idea of motion in the landscape. Landscapes aren't static, they move. You know, the four, if you're ever looking in a, out of a window in a car or a train, you can see that the foreground is moving by very rapidly. The midground moves in the opposite direction. And the background, often like a mountain or something, is stationary. So how do we capture that animated quality of landscape? So another device that Frank would do is set up this idea of the storyboard into a grid, where he would take his double odd uh, rapidiograph and just begin to design the concepts, the individual concepts of the spaces, you know, with the vegetation. And this single line would just move from one space to another. You can see it's almost one continuous line drawing as he's moving through the space. And then this, I love this, how the tree moves through the three different panels. And he's just continuing the gesture as he moves through the space. And what we have here, you know, is again, a whole 
design element tells the story of the design. It can be read, read in individually, backwards or forwards. Each one of these things can be taken out individually and looked at uh, in different sequences. Now, everybody needs a mentor. I was fortunate enough to grow up in the era of Ed Big Daddy Roth, the origi originator of the uh, custom T-shirt with spray painted with the airbrush. And what Roth would do is he, does, he in virtually invented this idea of the handmade car. He found that the, uh, the limited sort of supply of, of real cars was limiting his creativity. And he was the first sort of sculptural artist to actually make a car from scratch. Here he's making the beatnik bandit out of a mold of, of, uh, of plaster that's, being, that's then sanded down and uh, scraped and shaped by hand, and then he makes a plaster cast to, plas to, to create the image of the car, the, the final, the final uh, image of the car. And here we have the final. This is, these two cars are considered the greatest custom cars ever designed. This is, the, uh, this, is the beatnik, this is the outlaw, and this is the beatnik bandit. This was his first fiberglass car. You know, and this is the beatnik bandit, uh, which is considered the, the height of the custom car designer's craft. From it, like a well-designed object, no matter what view you take of this car, it looks different. You know, a well-designed object should look different from every view. I learned to draw not in art school, but copying these T-shirts that uh, that would appear every month in the hot rod magazines. And these little things I would enlarge and draw. And you can see this was my room in high school. It really scared my parents. You know, like the, this, this, was my, this was my art education, you know, learning to draw these sort of like complicated machines that are sort of about animated space and movement through space. And uh, the, the, those are sort of the beginning of my, of my, spa of my, uh, my drawing career. Now, this is uh, Von Dutch. Von Dutch is, created, is considered to be the creator of the pinstripe, where he uses this small little dagger brush and doesn't even start with a design. He just starts painting. And to me, he's sort of like, capturing you know, the essence of the automobile. And he's sort of like this direct connection to his brain where he's just following these patterns you know, that are reflecting sort of like, I guess, his subconscious flow of energy of the synapses. One of the things, he, he worked a lot for George Barris and Roth. And a lot of times, Barris would close up the custom shop at night. He'd leave a six pack of beer with, uh, with Von Dutch. And he'd come back in the morning, and the six pack of beer would be gone. And Von Dutch would still be painting. So you talk about, in some ways, you know, Von Dutch was really connected to this linear flow of creativity. You know, and this is one of his uh, last pieces. You know, and it's, it's hard to believe that this is symmetrical. And this is not drawn out first. It's just, it's just done. You know, so there's this direct connection you know, to the creative process. This is a man I studied with at, at the University of uh, Florida when I was in school, Howard Odom. Who, who almost, who took this idea, or I mean, I, this parallel idea of Von Dutch tracing these linear flows of energy through the automobile. And what uh, Howard Odom did was he was studying the flow of energy through ecosystems and giving, e giving each uh, track a kilocalorie evaluation so he could study the flows of energy through ecosystems, see if there are net energy gains or net energy losses. When I worked for Odom, I would spend hours looking, through, looking at these diagrams in his, in his library because they just fascinated me. Uh, th because what he was doing here is actually sort of synthesizing those hidden flows of nature, you know, those hidden flows of nature that we don't see in the landscape. That usually the artist, the, Charles Birchfield, the artist, painted these hidden flows of nature, these circulating na flows of nature that Odom was diagramming. You know, as a landscape architect, you know, like we have to think like this and we have to paint like this. We have to be able to, when we set up ecosystems, you know, we have to see these flows of nature, the cycles of wildlife. You know, like we are creating these complex ecological networks that hundreds of thousands of microbes to uh, wildlife and humans inhabit in these spaces and navigate through these spaces. One of the things I did when I first moved to California with, with the artwork uh, was I was trying to create gardens that would show these hidden flows of energy through the landscape. And uh, it, you know, I did hundreds of these drawings, just sitting down you know, like, and taking, taking Jack Kerouac's uh, um, uh, spontaneous prose as an inspiration and Von Dutch's 
methodology of just drawing continually, starting with a framework like the jazz artist, starting with the framework, and then just beginning to draw and respond to the, uh, the, the different images you know, that begin to appear. So these, weren't, these gardens really aren't planned out. They're sort of an exercise uh, in, in creativity and thinking and moving forward. These drawings, I'm trying to integrate this idea of the comic panel and use the form of contrasting and comparing where the, uh, the drawing or the garden becomes like a comic panel that can be read back and forth, uh, like Frank James was telling me. Now, I want to show you a few of the art installations that I did because I, I think there are several ways you can go with, with uh, how you project your work and how you begin to make changes in the landscape. You know, like I think you can write as a way of making uh, cultural change and environmental change. I think you can, you know, you can practice and, and make landscapes that respond to the environment. You can make art statements that make reactions to the landscape and have people see and they understand. And it's, a, it's an incredible ability to connect with the landscape. Now, I was fortunate enough when I moved to San Francisco, one of the reasons I wanted to go to California because there was this incredible movement of art installations. It was a real center for art installations. And I had an opportunity to do an installation with Topher Delaney. And again, you know, this was the size of the space. And I just begin to riff, you know, lay these drawings out. I did several hundred of them, you know, evolving the space. I knew this. I knew I wanted to do something with the four elements. I knew I wanted to make a statement about um, the uh, environment in in California. And uh, the final product was based on the, the four Platonic solids, which is earth, air, water, and um, and how those four elements work in the landscape, the use of fire, you know, like, so this was sort of like an ecological statement that talked about the four different ecologies of California, the earthquakes, the fire, you know, the lack of water in the landscape. The next installation I did was in, um, in uh, Tampa, Florida. And uh, here I was uh, looking at this idea of making the sort of the Birchfield diagram come alive. You know, th like trying to show those hidden flows of energy coming up out into the garden and using the gazing globe at the center to reflect these uh, four elements of the garden into a center sort of piece that take the four different charges and pull them together. One of the problems with doing installations is this stuff always ends up somewhere. You know, this particular installation ended up in my mother's garage. And for about five years, every summer that I came home, she said, Chip, you got to get rid of this. You know, you got to get rid of it. So I finally rented a, rented a pickup truck. And I was loading this up into a pickup truck to take it to a dump. And uh, my neighbor came by and he says, what are you doing with that? And I said, oh, I'm throwing it away. I'm taking it to the, the dump. He says, well, don't. Give it to me. I'm building a cottage up in the woods. And let me, let me take it to the cottage in the woods. So I did. I gave it to him. I said, just send me a picture. So he sent me a picture. And here it is. Here's my artwork you know, decorating his latrine. <laughs> you know, it's like, so I mean, at least it, at least it took on a, you know, another life form. This is an installation I did uh, at the Cap Street Project in San Francisco with uh, Francis Butler. And what we wanted to do is sort of in, you know, investigate and do demonstrations of the four ethereal elements of uh, the landscape. And we created these huge dioramas that were viewer operated where you would turn cranks and uh, the aurora borealis would move, the, the water would move through the earth. And, and in the very center, we were, we were very much interested in sort of capturing this sort of like axis mundi that runs from the heavens through the earth and through the center of the earth. And we wanted to kind of display, as, as you walked into the interior of this grotto, make, make a display and make a statement about uh, how about um, uh, plant, uh, animal species that were endangered and disappearing. So we got skulls from uh, you know, endangered species. Don't tell me, ask me how we got those. And we put them in these uh, you know, bell jars and lit them from the inside so that you, when you walked into this space, this dark space, you would be confronted with this, you know, the dying of nature. And this, this piece was supposed to be at the San Francisco Garden Show until the, the, uh, the garden committee came and look at, looked at it. And they called me up and they said, well, we don't think that this is what the weekend gardener is going to want to look at you know, to inspire their gardens. This is Ed Roth in one of his, in one of his more creative moments where the, he's sort of like, I guess the cars are just sort of becoming all over him. This is my best friend, Vince. And one of the great things about coming to California and growing up admiring hot rods was finally being part of a hot rod movement. And Vince had really good cars. And we used to drive around uh, looking at cars. This is a 49 Mercury. That's one of the, considered to be one of the great uh, customized, uh, one of the great bodies for customizing it. And one of the things that Vince and I did was we spent a lot of time discussing what is the perfect flame. 
You know, the beauty of the Southern California custom car painters is that they're using the whole body as a canvas. And that this is art that's not being done for art galleries. This is art that's being done on the weekends. You know, like this is, this is true art. And we were discussing, you know, like the sort of revival of the flame and what would be the perfect flame. And we got a, uh, a, uh, an invitation to uh, do a piece of garden art for an uh, installation for a, a garden show in San Francisco. And we decided that we would, we would try to create the perfect flame. And this is the, uh, this is the Oakland Custom, Custom and Rod Show, which I'm kind of amped about because I just went last weekend to look at the, look at the cars. And you know, th at this time, there was an incredible amount of custom flames going on. But this is to get started. I mean, we would go out drinking and eating. And this is like we would do the sketches. Uh, you know, like you have to find restaurants that have paper uh, uh, settings you know, that you can really sketch out and draw on napkins. So here's a, the design process where we're starting to work out the ideas for the perfect flame. And we, you know, we enlarged it. We made model, model, uh, you know, cardboard models out of it. You know, used light, moved it around, and uh, this is the pieces that finally came out where we used a strong light to cast the flame shadow. And then this image, uh, the the drawing that we had accompany the show. This image shows this idea of the the flame shooting out of the, the meteor, sliding across my garden, and then finishing up on a on a Merc, uh, 49 Mercury grill. Now, one of the things about working, you know, like in the creative process, I think it's really hard, really important to work really hard. And then when you're done, you can really party hard. And this is uh, North Beach. This is Tosca. This is usually after I've spent, you know, two or three months in the studio trying to crank out one of these installations. Vince and I would go to Tosca's. And this is early in the evening when we just, uh, after our first drink. And that's, uh, this is sort of, <laughs> you know, like, th that's, uh, I think it's, uh, we're, we're about ready to get thrown out of the, uh, thrown out of the bar. Now, the, the last installation I want to talk about is this idea of viewing the landscape. In the uh, 18th century, painters used these clod mirrors, which were these plano convex lenses with a gold backing. They would take them out into the landscape, and they would paint from them. Because what it would do is it would reduce the scale of the landscape to a small image. And it also gave it a golden glow glow because all of the paintings that Claude Lorraine never used a Claude mirror, but these, these paintings that Claude and Salvador Rossi and the rest of them were doing in Italy were coming back to England with the golden color of the skies. And if you've been to England, you know the sky is leaden gray. So they would take these mirrors out into the landscape to give themselves sort of this golden overcast. So I won this competition to do an installation. No, I, I had to submit a um, a uh, uh, construction drawings, you know, to win the competition to do this installation in San Francisco. And this is interesting because I was sitting around with my ex-girlfriend at a coffee shop, you know, drawing on uh, a newspaper, you know, and we're talking the idea through. It's like three days before the the uh, competition, uh, the drawings are due, and then we're sitting around talking back and forth. And these were the original drawings that I came up with the idea. And I felt like, well, if I could come up with an idea, I would do it. So those were the original draw the original gestural ideas. And then this was the first sketches that I did trying to work out what I wanted to do is make the world's largest Claude mirror that would reflect City Hall and distort it into this pastoral Claude Lorraine landscape. And I wanted to do it, you know, with this sort of idea of the apertures. So the idea was that you'd walk by the solid wall, and there'd be two viewing apertures with different colored lenses in them. And you would look through that, and that would reflect the image of City Hall, which was across the street. One of the things I didn't realize is it's sort of an amazing psychological thing. You put a hole in the wall, and people will look through it. You know, I was worried nobody would stop and look. But the minute I put the hole in the wall, before we were even done, people were stopping and looking at the image. And the image turned out pretty good. Here is the, the reflection. On the reverse of this, I painted a Claude Lorraine landscape. So we get this image of City Hall being reflected in sort of this pastoral 18th century romantic landscape. But it's distorted and evil, like, uh, Jerry, uh, like uh, you know, Willie Brown destroying the landscape of San Francisco. So I want to finish up with the, uh, this idea of gar energy in the garden. And uh, the beginning of the research for this book. I worked on this book for 20 years, if you can believe that. The great thing about school is I started it when, in, in when I was an undergraduate. It was during the first energy crisis. And I was looking for a way as creating landscape that could heal the, heal the garden, you know, using the garden elements to heal the landscape. How can we use the garden to reduce our energy consumption? You know, energy consumption is increasing. There was an oil embargo. And uh, I was really lucky that when the book came out, this, this sort of energy crisis is still with us. You know, it's not often you get two 
two chances in life. So the whole idea was uh, how can we use the garden to reduce energy consumption? How can we come up with new forms of the landscape that we've never seen before, you know, to deal with these problems? And what I started to do is I set up the hypothesis, and this is another important thing. Every, you always have to start with a hypothesis. You know, the first step is the hardest thing. So my hypothesis was I was going to use uh, Ian McCard, a quote from Ian McCards from uh, Design on the Land, that the historical garden was only sort of a, a beautiful appendage to the architecture. It was only an exercise in Euclidean geometry. And that was going to be my starting statement. And I found out, as I began my research, I was dead wrong. You know, that was going to be the, art. I was going to write an article for Landscape Architecture Magazine, and uh, that was, what, and the more, every, almost every other paragraph in Georgina Maison's book on Italian gardens proved me wrong. You know, in a matter of a couple of months, I found hundreds of examples of how the historical garden was acting as a passive microclimate to make people comfortable in all seasons, to cool in the summer and warm spaces in the winter. You know, I found Pliny the Younger, you know, the Roman, you know, was writing letters and describing these passive architectural devices in his garden, where he would use icy springs under a shady uh, trellis to use the coolness of the, of the water to cool this little microclimate. And then he would float the water where he would float food to keep the food and, and grapes cool, cool enough to drink in the space. And, uh, you know, Pliny the Younger, I couldn't believe it. You know, like all those years ago, the more examples I found, the, the more, you know, the more that led me on. You know, it was like this tree of, of expanding, exploding ideas. And then, you know, I was lucky enough to be living in Miami, Florida. Well, I don't know if that's luck or not, but maybe it was. And on the weekend, a bunch of friends at the office tried to con convince me to teach them how to watercolor in the garden. So on the weekends, we would go to Fairchild Tropical Gardens or Villa Sky, which is a recreation of a, an Italian villa. And one of the first things I noticed in that, when I, in the hot summer sun, I would get out of the shade into this grotto that was like 20 degrees cooler than the outside. And you had these walls that water was being misted and cooled as a drop down. Water was being sprayed on the ground. And I was going, holy cow, this is like 20 degrees cooler. And, and the response to the energy crisis, in Florida anyway, was that buildings were made more and more hermetically sealed. Instead of using landscape as a solution for the energy crisis, it was, it was, it was being avoided, that the outside exterior of the architecture of the landscape was being sealed up that the buildings were, by code, were being, the architects were being told to design buildings more efficient for air conditioning rather than reducing energy consumption. So, uh, use, you know, like finally I, I was able to get to Italy to study these gardens firsthand, and I began to use drawing as a way of drawing myself into the landscape. You know, by sitting into a space with my thermometer and my wind gauge, I would, you know, I would try to pick a space that seemed comfortable and sit in that garden, begin to like analyze the devices that, that worked. In this, in this garden, you know, with this alley, uh, sitting in the space and trying to analyze what was working, the interior of the space of these oak trees was, were trimmed up like a cathedral. The thick, dense vegetation blocked the sun. But the interesting thing is that the walkway was sunken into the ground to use the cool earth, and that the trees were placed, you know, in this embankment so that you're using the cool earth to sort of like generate, you know, this coolness and the shade. You know, in this device, I was just sitting at the Villa de Este because it was comfortable, I was eating my lunch, and I began to notice in the summertime where it was like, you know, about 98 degrees, that uh, there was this incredible breeze blowing through these, this little grill work. And I was going, well, why is it nice and chilly? Why is it cool here? And then I looked down below and I drew that. Then I realized that the cool air was rising up, or the hot air was rising up, and being cooled by these vertical fountains, and then being forced through these small little apertures. And the way the seat was designed, it was placed right next to this ventilated space. Here at the um, Villa, de, uh, Villa Medici in uh, Fiesole, outside of Florence, this little pavilion is placed at sort of the apex of the, uh, the wind flow as it comes crashing up a hillside and is forced through these small little apertures as you overlook the garden. So I divided the book Garden and Climate into four, the four elements, which I thought was a good way to begin. And uh, the first element is earth. And I looked at this idea of the earth as a metaphysical thing, that we owe our sustenance to the earth. All things are grown from the earth. But also this idea of the grotto, the earth, you know, and the grotto throughout history, the Zoroastrians used this, this idea of the grotto as a religious sort of like function. You know, we, we, we evolved out of the cave. You know, the cave, the underground cavern was, was the thing that, that uh, gave us protection. You know, and in the Renaissance garden, the cave, the earth is used as a, as a cooling device for the summer. 
You know, in the medieval garden, this idea of the earth seat, where the seat is built up off the ground and it is covered with not wood or concrete, but a, 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 um, a plantation of uh, grass. We've all in the summertime laid down on the grass, you know, and, and it's nice and cool. So here this idea of this cool seat, of this earth seat being built up with aromic flowers and that it was built, usually built up against a wall in the shade. So this idea of being able to sit elevated on, on the earth. And uh, the idea of using the earth to create stones. On the north side, so this would be in shade in the summertime, here the serpentine sort of like earthly organic bench is carved in the, uh, the, 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 uh, the Villa Bamarzo outside of, uh, you know, halfway between Florence and Rome. Earth, you know, the grotto. Fascinating thing that I always felt so incredibly strange to look at. I could never figure out what the grotto really was about. Was it an artifice? What was it? The grotto appears in almost every Italian garden. It's a place where the family would retreat in the summertime and almost spend the whole day. This grotto in, in, in the Palazzo Farnese in Capriola does something even more intriguing where these, these dark tunnels go back into the earth so they're capturing the cool air as it's coming out of these tunnels and then this whole ceiling is a series of small little dripping fountains where the water comes cascading down into this feature and then there's this large open space in front of that where, where you sit and dine. The idea of the earth, you, at the Villa Rupert, here uh, an earth bench, an earth seat is carved into the ground where you walk down into the space. It's funny, it's right next to the ocean. The ocean disappears, but you hear that crashing of the ocean. The shade trees, the shade ilex trees over top create a nice little cool little niche. And here you have like a bench on the north side carved directly into the earth. So the earth becomes this incredibly uh, in, in, intricate device used you know, throughout the uh, Renaissance garden. And this device, this grotto, when, when, it, when it was in existence, there was a, this is right inside of a mountain. And they, they had placed a, a mirror throughout the back. So when you, when you appeared, when you walked up these stairs, it looked like the grotto went right through. You know, so this sort of optical illusion of brightness of space that it's a tunnel that goes through the mountain. The other thing that they would do, this wonderful sort of like face up here at the top, when the garden was open to the public on weekends uh, for performance and stuff, they would begin the evening by lighting a, a fire in the monster's mouth. So that when you, would when you would approach it in the evening, the mouth would be glowing red, the eyes would be embers, and there'd be smoke coming out of the nostrils. At the end of the night, the embers would be shoveled out of the mouth, so it would create this sort of like incredible, like foaming, flaming mouth coming out of the face. This other anthropomorphic device at the Villa Medici in Pratolino, built for the last of the Medicis, uh, who, you know, Ferdinand de Medici was an alchemist. He built this device as sort of an allegory of the elements of mining and alchemy, that the shaft of earth goes into the earth and that each sort of like element that's taken out of the earth is refined till you get to the brain of the monster. And it was di directly on the center of the axis of the garden. And he would, he would disappear for weeks on end to go into this, into this piece and he would take his fishing pole and, and fish out of the eyeball into this, into this fountain. And that's the, he was the last of the Medicis. At the Vi Villa Madama, here we see like underneath the terrace, these three grotto-like structures built in direct relationship to the water so that the cool breezes as they come up take the water, the, the, the evaporation that's happening off the water and to take them into these shady devices which are in the shade in the summertime. We see at the, uh, the Villa Giulia, uh, a day villa built for the Pope, is interesting because what he's done is taken, combined this idea of the grotto and the underground water, that this was like uh, an underground room, the subterranean room built three floors into the ground and then filled with water so you could actually swim and go into, you know, take these grottos, the, it becomes a water grotto where you would actually swim and, and disappear inside, you know, inside of the space. The Cryptoporticus, uh, Pliny the Younger talks about his Cryptoporticuses as his villa. Alberti writes about the, the different designs that the, the Cryptoporticus can take. The Cryptoporticus is an underground hallway used in the garden to connect different parts of the garden where the family uh, can move in the summertime and you can actually walk from one space, to one garden space to the other. And uh, at Hadrian, this is at Hadrian's villa, there are probably seven miles of these underground Cryptoporticuses. And what they were, when they were in existence, the walls were covered with uh, mosaics of under, underwater uh, fishes and underwater plants and stuff. So you really got this sort of aqua kind of feeling as you were underneath the landscape. Now, the, the um, Hadrian's Villa is directly below the Villa d'Este in Tivoli. 
And the early French visitors to Hadrian's Villa talk about this cryptoporticus that was built into the architecture, that the villa is placed at sort of the apex of the hill, so you have this hot air rising up, and then it's forced through this small little opening that the Venturi effect, so this change in air pressure, the, 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 the air actually speeds velocity as it moves through this long, narrow uh, uh, cryptoporticus. And then it's, it's cooled by passing over a series of fountains. And then at the ceiling of the cryptoporticus, the cool air rises up into each of the rooms above. So here we have an example of a, a primitive form of air conditioning taking place. Earth is also used. The Bosco, I think, the, wood, the woodland, the sacred wood, is another one of those wonderful elements in a landscape architecture prescribed in the Roman Renaissance as a proportion to the architecture. That any piece of architecture built in the landscape had to have this proportion of, of woodland next to it, the sacred grove, you know, the wild woodland. And you can see the prescription was that there'd be this transition from the architecture to the, uh, the parterre, to the more formal uh, Bosco, to the wild wood. And you can see that, you know, like this was designed also as a wildlife preserve, you know, that there were, these were hunting gardens. So there was sort of an ecological element uh, designed here. Here at the Villa Torlonia, you can see an interesting sort of like uh, uh, cryptoporticus that allows you to reach up to the top space where you go into the earth and out of the sunlight to go up to the higher steps ab above. So you go into the earth and make your way up uh, to the top fountain at the very top. In the Torlonia, you can see a couple of things happening here. This is uh, uh, by a book, a book by Edith Wharton, and the paintings are done by Maxfield Parrish. And to me, they really the paintings really illustrate this idea of climate and garden. I mean, here, the, the, uh, the priest is not contemplating in the sunlight, he's contemplating in, in, the, in the shade. So you can see the Bosco being used for its dense shade and the contrast of the highlight of the, of the light, uh, this, this contrast of light and dark makes the shade that much cooler. And the use of light to, to animate and, and illuminate this central feature. Uh, and you can see this golden light of Rome. You know, so you have this wonderful contrast. The golden light is made more golden by the darkness of the space. So almost every Italian garden, not only did they have grottos, but they had the, the, adjacent, the adjacent Bosco, you know, as a place where the family would move in the summertime and walk through the space. The Villa Garzoni, uh, up until the 30s, had this really peculiar, uh, wonderful sort of flat top uh, garden. I mean, I guess what people do with their hair now is what uh, landscape architects did with vegetation in the Renaissance. It's kind of interesting that the top of the garden is a flat top and then the cypress trees acts as an accent. But what's interesting about this, in the summertime, the way you would get up to the top is there are a series of parallel pathways cut into this Bosco. So you'd move back and forth in the woodlands to make your journey to the top and then return by the, uh, the second half to make your journey down to the bottom. Another wonderful device the uh, pineum, which is a, a rectangular grid of pine trees placed very, very close together. There were hundreds of these in Rome. The, the Roman emperors used them as a way of uh, draining marshes. They were used agriculturally for the pine nuts, the you know, pinoli, for that the, the, the taste so great in pesto. Uh, they were used as great passive devices in the summertime because you have several things happening here. Before this was planted in grass, it was sand. So there is something really peculiar about the heat when the heat heats up the sap of the, of the pine trees, you get this wonderful aroma. When just a wee bit of air moves through the leaves, it makes a sound of music. And then you get this golden light with the ruffled sort of shadows that being cast on the ground plane. So it's an incredible space to be in a cathedral-like because the, uh, the um, umbrella pines are tripped up, trimmed up from the bottom, so they create this like golden canopy of leaves across the, across the top. If you've ever been in one of these spaces, when the wind's blowing and the summer, it's nice and hot, and uh, you feel the breeze moving through, it's, they're incredibly, incredibly wonderful spaces. One of the things I looked at in each one of the sections of the book was uh, developing a vocabulary, using history to develop this vocabulary of form, and then reassembling this vocabulary in, in form into contemporary gardens. So what would these, you know, like the combination of these elements, uh, how would they work? You know, using the cryptoporticus in the prevailing uh, direction of the breezes to bring the cool air in the interior, using the Bosco to the north 
to block the cold northern breezes, using the umbrella pines on the western side of the garden to allow the golden light to come through, using the grotto as a, as a, as a device to pull cool air into the garden, but using uh, the garden seat. So these, at each one of the four sections, I'm looking at combining all of these elements into a, a contemporary garden. The next element is sun, which is an incredibly important thing, especially this time of year. You know, the sun was used, you know, I guess when you don't have all these alternative sources of energy, you really have to figure out where the sun is. And it's not too difficult. In the summertime, the sun is higher. So the, so the, the, uh, the, the interior space will be in the shade. In the wintertime, when it's lower, it moves into the space and heats the space. The back of the, the, back of the loggia is blocked to the prevailing cold northern breezes. So you have this simple idea of the loggia oriented in the, in the proper direction, as, acts as an incredibly, uh, incredibly powerful passive solar device. Here the idea of the hot seat. You know, at the, at the uh, Alcazar in Seville, you have this uh, um, tiled seat high enough, you know, so that it's just, just almost above your head, so it blocks the cold breezes from this direction. It's high enough to capture the sun. If you've ever sat on one of these warm benches in the wintertime, when they're radiate, re radiating the heat out, it's quite wonderful. Here at the Villa Pia, uh, outside of the Vatican, you see the height of this hot seat. You know, it's an oval shape, so no matter what time of year, you can sit in the shade or the sunlight. The hot walk. At, at the, in, in Hadrian's villa, he designed this, this passeggiata, this idea of walking for health, you know, is still in existence in the Mediterranean country. That he built this mile-long walk that uses these uh, solar powers, so the sunlight would, would penetrate in the wintertime. It would be shady in the summertime. It even had cul-de-sacs at either end where you could get to the end of the, end of the walk and turn around and walk back. The hot walk Almost every garden had this idea of a hot walk, where it's, it's built south-facing to capture the, the, winter, the low winter sunlight. It's built into an, an earthen wall, and it's usually next to a bosco to block the cold northern breezes. At the Villa Farnese in uh, Capriola, it's kind of interesting, because Vignola designed this garden as a, as a winter, uh, winter garden and a summer garden. The winter garden is on the south side to capture this, this, the, low, the low winter sun. On the nor it's placed on the north side for the uh, summertime, so it will be in shade. He even divided the villa into, into, into summer apartments and winter apartments. The winter apartments in the south to capture the sunlight. He even used psychological paintings. The winter apartments were painted with bright colors. The uh, summer apartments with, were painted with uh, drippy, kind of like wet, mossy landscape scenes. So here we see at the, at the, uh, the uh, Alhambra uh, in Seville, the, in, in, in the, in the wintertime, the low sun is penetrating the space and warming the back wall. The Islamic garden built the pavilion with high, tall columns so that in the wintertime, the sunlight penetrates and warms the space. South facing, the, 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 the walls are blocked on the northern side to block the cold northern breezes. Uh, at, in the Alcazar, there's a series of walks, of elevated walks, where you can walk above the garden in those, in, in not the really cold winter, but that part of the winter where the sunlight's shining, so these spaces are unprotected, but the sun is warm enough that you can walk above the garden and look down at the parterres, the parterres which would be wet and damp in the winter time. And Peter the Cruel's walk is along the northern side, so it's a solid wall along the north, and then the, the arches are open to the south so that uh, you can walk along the garden in the middle of the winter time protected, and, and warmth by the sun and look down at the garden. Again, at Peter the Cruel's walk is also elevated. The Giardino Segreto is a perfect example of use of solar power. It's a solar room. It's a sunken room, sunken into the earth, so it's below the earth. You walk into it in the wintertime. It's below the earth, so the cool breezes go overhead. It's just wide enough so to, to allow the maximi maximization of sunlight, you know, to warm the space. And uh, in, in the Villa Imperiale, this sunken garden, since the wind's coming from the Adriatic Sea, you have the Bosco built up so the, the cool uh, wind will go over the top. But it's open to the, to the west, so the western sunlight can heat up the space. 
The Giardino Segreto, and this is idea of landscape architecture. At the, uh, at the Villa Farcanieri, here trees are used as architecture where the cypress trees are densely placed almost two feet on center to make a Giardino Segreto out of living plant material. And here the rusticated pool is a flat pool of water. There's no fountains in the center, so this idea of the sunlight will reflect off of this mirror-like surface, reflect the light back into the space. The trees are dense enoughly packed together to block the breezes, but yet contain the sun. And at the, the Isolato in, um, at the Boboli Gardens in Florence is what I call a solar clock. So no matter what time of year, you can either sit in the shade or find a warm place in the sun. And here, the landscape is architecture. The, the architecture is created out of landscape, where these solid walls of ilex trees are placed really densely and clipped very densely to uh, create a solid wall of architecture and landscape. Another example of solar energy is this idea of the lemoniah. You know, this use of solar power to, to power the, uh, the greenhouses in the wintertime. They're usually, they're always uh, south facing. They have a solid wall on the north side. They're usually, you know, twice as high as they are wide, so allow maximum penetration of sunlight in the wintertime. And they're stepped up so that you're maximizing the sunlight in the wintertime. And then in the spring, in May, a great sort of like, you know, great a ceremony is made where these, these are taken out and placed into the garden. So the color in the garden is watching the orange blossoms come up. If you've ever been in an orange grove, you know, when the orange blossoms are blossoming, it's an incredibly wonderful experience. And then you watch the color, you know, the, the, the fruit bloom. At the Villa, Villa, um, at the, uh, Villa Medici in, in Castello, there are over 350 varieties of fruits in the garden. And I'm just one of them, I guess, right here. But um, the, the garden we have to look at not as an exercise in geometry, but gardens at this time were sustainable devices. I mean, they were part of an agricultural system you know, that was being used to produce food for not just the owners, but all of the people that worked on the garden. So there is this sort of sustainable element of landscape that, that is, exists throughout history. The next element is air. The use of channeling cool breezes in the summertime for passive, for, for passive cooling. And the simplest device that I found at the uh, Alcazar in uh, Seville is this wonderful window seat built in that area, you know, that aerial underneath that aerial walkway, where the wall is thick enough so it doesn't, it doesn't, um, it doesn't heat up in the summertime. The back of the seat is placed is is placed with. Uh, blue tiles which are psychologically cooling and if you sat on tiles in the summertime in the shade they're generally a lot cooler than the rest of the landscape. It's in shade but the wonderful thing is these small little apertures are placed in the direction of the prevailing breezes so the Venturi effect allows the breezes to pick up velocity as they move through this wonderful little window seat. The pleached alley and the alley are two forms of, of, of landscape design elements that are used to direct breezes into the garden. They're used to walk in the summertime in shade. They're generally placed very tightly close together, so they're in the, they're in the shade. The pleached alley is a wonderful device where the oak trees are actually uh, woven together at the top, and they grow together to form a continuous arch. At the Villa Gori, you can see the garden, which is agriculture. These are vineyards and fruit trees. Uh, the, the garden device is basically these two pleached alleys that go out into the garden that are terminated by these various devices so that you can walk into the landscape. And I measure these. They're like 72 degrees. They're about 20 degrees cooler than the rest of the landscape. And you can see these thick ilex insulation. And the dappled light that you see at the Boboli Gardens in Florence really gives effect of this, this sort of change in uh, quality of light. And uh, they're generally placed in the direction of the breezes. Now, the format is very simple for passive design. And you can find it throughout the world. In Islamic gardens, even in small urban villas, the living structures are built along the north side. The north wall is solid to block the cold northern breezes. The, the, the width of the architecture of the living spaces are just wide enough so that in the wintertime, the sunlight penetrates and warms the space. In the summertime, the wind is higher. I mean, the, 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 the light is higher, so they're in shade. They're placed in the direction of the prevailing breezes, so the breezes from the south come over 
and are filtered out and cooled. By the, the, the filtration works with the leaves of the trees. The coolness happens when the, the, the air is forced over a series of fountains. Adjacent to the opening of the structure is a large pool of water that acts as a reservoir. And then in the summertime, further developments are used, this idea of the, of the adjustable shades to really get maximized cooling. This one at the Bagi Na, I really like this nautical device where the, these canvas awnings are stretched out and pulled over and tied over this pool of water where the evapotranspiration of the water is evaporating. It's in the direction of the prevailing breezes, so the breezes are being moved in. And at the, uh, at the same time, if you've ever been in a sailing or the, this, the sound moving, like, like at the Pinea, the sound moving through the, uh, the canvas creates this incredible, like, you know, wonderful waffling sound. Sometimes they, would, they were wetted, so the evaporation would cool it. Sometimes they were, they were wet down with rose water, so you'd get this aromatic quality uh, happening. Uh, this, this sort of hypothetical garden take, built for Florida, South Florida, takes that idea into, into extent where uh, the four living units are placed close together. Uh, the, the, the cool breezes are brought in through pleached alleys. The, 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 the house in the summertime is always in to total shade. There's an ascending uh, series of, of uh, trellises that keep the house sh in shade in the, winter t in, the, in the summertime. It's blocked northern breezes on the back. And you can see the forms that I, when I first started doing these, I thought the forms would be rather boring, but the gardens actually become very, very in interesting. The last element, water, which I think is perhaps the, one of the most important now because not only are we faced with an energy crisis, but, but our sources of water are declining really rapidly. And I think it's pretty important to look at this idea of water, not only as a passive coolant, cooling device, but also as how do we conserve water. The Islamic garden, did everything possible to retain all of the water. One of these, these things called quants were built at the basis of mountains where the streams, were, where the water uh, is coming, con condensation is coming down so that these, these underground tunnels are collecting the water at the base of the mountain throughout the year and then they're directed into cisterns and then distrib distributed. In the garden, every drop of water that falls on the ground is saved and turned into cisterns. I, when I gave this lecture in California to the Water Conservatory, they told me that in Los Angeles, before they built all the canals, that the houses in the 20s were actually built on top of uh, cisterns. So this idea of saving all the water and storing it in underground cisterns where the water doesn't evaporate is very important. How do you move the water through the garden? In Persia, this idea of building these sort of raised canals where the water would go from one space to another is a great idea, but you would lose water through evaporation. So what they would do is they would combine this idea of agriculture so, so that fruit trees were placed next, you know, right next to each other, right next to the water trough to, to use the water to grow the fruit trees, but at the same time, you know, harvest the fruit for cultivation, but at the same time the trees are providing shade for the water, water as it moves through the garden. Drip irrigation is a big deal right now. And one of the things that was used before drip irrigation is these, un, you know, un, uh, these uh, earthen jars that uh, would be f sunken into the earth, filled with water, and because they're earthen, they would uh, transpire. And the water would transpire very slowly and sweat on the outside of the jar, irrigating the agricultu agricultural product. A brilliant idea. They would be covered with a stopper at the top, and uh, you get this sort of like continual dripping. I mean, we do it all wrong. We dump a lot of water on the landscape at once. This idea of spreading it out is much, more, is much better for conservation. Even in, even in you know, like these architectural wonders of the Palazzo Farnese, which is an incredibly, you know, I mean, it just, just an incredible work of architecture, a work of genius. But I was surprised to find out when I was studying these old drawings done by uh, Vignola that the whole idea is based around the central uh, circular courtyard where he's collecting all of the water that runs off and is into the center uh, drain and is stored into the center cistern in the middle of the space. And not only that, the moat around the building is also used to capture all the excess runoff from the garden and then it's used back to uh, irrigate the garden. The underground cistern in, in Cordoba, at the Court of the Oranges, is kind of remarkable because the whole Court of the Oranges is a rooftop garden built above this gigantic uh, uh, orange grove. And the beauty of this is the orange trees line up with the columns of the mosque, but at the same time, the source of water is, is, is ingenious where there's a central fountain that takes the water and moves it through these, these runnels 
and each row of trees is irrigated by placing a wood block here, and they're still doing it today. You can, I just took these pictures two years ago. You can see the wood block with the, with the, uh, with the, uh, the piece of uh, fabric to further irrigate it. And what they put the block of water here, allow the Rennell to be, to be uh, full of water. This, this tree would get watered, then they would move the block to the next tree, then the water would fill that. But the beauty of this is that the evaporating water would be kept in by the dark evergreen leaves of the orange trees. And it would create a, a, a wonderful little miraculous microclimate. And then you get these pebbles that reflect, the design of the pebbles reflects the movement of water as it moves through the irrigation. So here you have the irrigation, ref, you know, like reflecting the design and the design reflecting the irrigation. It's quite remarkable and it's remarkable that it's still being used today. This idea of, you know, the, the, when, when there's not a lot of water, water is used ingeniously. And here we have a simple flow, a flat plane of water going over a chinicanas, which is a, 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 slant, a slanted washboard pattern. And these take on many different ways. They face the south, so when the sunlight hits them, you maximize this quality of the sound of water, the churning up of the water as it cascades over this serrated surface, that there are a million different ways that these serrations are, are designed. And here in Morocco, we see one of these at the museum at the Morocco, we see one of these devices where the water container, the storage device is here. The water cascades down into the interior of the space. So here it's being used in a totally, in, you know, like an interior enclosed room. As you make the transition from one space to another, this idea of, of water banister, where the water is used to cool your psychological transition from space, from one space to the other in the summertime, but at the same time, it's the height of a hand, so as you move up the space, you can put your hand in the water. One of the things about cooling is if you can cool your appendages, you know, your feet and hands are the things that get cold the first in the wintertime. But in the summertime, you know, like if you can cool those, those two appendages quickest, you know, like you will like, you know, physically cool yourself down, but at the same time, psychologically, psychologically cool you. Now, you've all seen movies. And it seems like there's this interesting phenomena of movies where it's always filmed after a wet down. There's some sort of psychological uh, feeling about not being in the rain, but right after the rain. Somehow, it, maybe it has to do with, one of my students did a study where negative is positive, that the negative ions right before a thunderstorm and after a thunderstorm are a very creative period. You know, maybe the early, the movie directors realize that there's a sort of like creative atmosphere when they, they do the wet down. They have these special trucks where they run through the set and wet down the landscape to get that atmosphere. Um, and, you know, in the garden, it's d the same thing is done. It's a beautiful device that's called, a, you know, not a really a wet down, but these, these uh, Joki de Aquas come on to wet down the surface. You know, they're not running continuously. So what they do is they dampen the dust. You know, they make, it, they make the pathway look like you're walking in a summer stream. If you're walking on the space, the jets are hitting your ankles and your feet. And uh, the idea of this creating the pathway is this shimmering, being able to walk in this shimmering uh, sort of quality of landscape is really, it's really wonderful. The Joca di Acqua is one of my favorite things that the Italian landscape architect came up with. That you'd be sitting in the garden and all of a sudden a jet would come on and wet your back. Or you'd be attracted to a, a sculptural device in the landscape and go to contemplate it and then suddenly get blasted. And also this idea of choreography, you know, of animating the landscape. The Italian uh, gardener would devise these devices. In the summertime, as you're walking through a space, all of a sudden the jets would come on and chase you, chase you in a certain direction where you would think you would get refuge. And then all of a sudden the hydro fountain would come on and get you blasted from another four directions. So you would run in into the inside of the grotto to get out of that jet of water. And from the four winds, you'd have these huge jets that were strong enough to almost knock you off your feet. When they would shut off, you'd think you'd finally be out of it. But um, Flora, you know, all of a sudden, out of all of her flowers, miniature little jets would cascade down and give you a final dumping of water so that you totally wet as you move through the garden. But when you'd move back out into the 90 degree weather, you would um, really appreciate it. So this idea of water, I think, as a passive cooling device, not only psychologically, but physiologically, is a very important element in this idea of passive design. The last garden I did was this for Southern, Southern California in the, in the uh, built up against the Everglades was an idea of taking, you know, the, the water from the wintertime from the, when we have our, our rainstorms and storing it. 
and that this idea of water would be stored and that every element, you know, as it moves through the garden, I mean, we tend to use water singularly in California, either to irrigate the farm fields, you know, like decoratively, you know, to flush the toilets, to drink. And the idea was to explore how the water could be used to do all of these things, take the waste away, but at the same time, I think every every drop of water that falls on the ground should be saved and stored. And at the very last element, the water is, you know, goes back into the aquifer and hopefully repeats that pro pro process. Now, in summary, I wanted to talk about this. I won this fellowship at Boli at, in, in Bellagio, the Rockefeller Foundation. And uh, it's in Lake Como in northern Italy. And while I was there, you know, you always have to explain why you're there. You know, I said, well, I'm working on this book on passive design. And what I ended up doing is just using the villa as an example. I, was, I would say it was in November, and I'd say, well, look, this is what I'm talking about. If you notice the building's one room deep, if you notice the low winter sun it penetrates the space and warms the space. And I said, if you look outside, there's a bosco of trees out back that blocks the cold northern winds. And then if you, I said, and if you look to the south, you see the agriculture is placed to the south so that in the summertime, the cool summer breezes come up the hill and, and cool the architecture. You know, so I went on with all these ideas. About a week before I was to leave, I was reading the historical documentation on the villa, come to find out it was one of Pliny's villas. It was one of the places that Pliny the, Pliny the Younger wrote about this passive architectural design that sort of motivated me on my whole journey. And that was kind of, kind of strange. Then finishing the book, you know, I was finishing the book where I started it. This is a, uh, a garden dedicated to Don Quixote. And uh, the, beautiful, beauty, the beauty of it is it's in Seville. And, and when it was built, it was built as a library. You know, I think this is sort of an interesting allegory for me that the garden is an, is an allegory for knowledge, you know, that nature is there for us to study and learn from. The garden is an education, you know, it's a tool that we can learn from. You know, it t you know great gardens are, you know, mean great cu cultures. So in summary, I want to talk about this idea of understanding the movement through space. You know, recently, you know, after I got tenure, I was able to hang out, finally hang out at the pool hall and uh, watch Mexican Ed and Filipino Gene and Keith or the Ether shoot pool. And I probably learned more from them than I've learned from anybody else, watching them uh, play pool and, and how they move through, a, move through a game. I mean, here, this was a $50 bet that uh, I, couldn't, I couldn't run out. And what I did is knock the six ball as hard as I could in this pocket, push the cue ball out here, knock the nine out of the way, got this ball in, drew back, got the, got the three, came over there and got the, got the eight ball in. If the guy was betting that I couldn't move, move, you know, move it through the space. But this idea of thinking about landscape as movement, you know, that the landscape's not a static thing. And thinking of the landscape as something we can learn about. One of the things I like about Poole is it's the, it's the music of the spheres, that these bodies uh, in space are activated by this physical act of moving the cue ball, which is you, the designer, the director, as you move things through the space. So in summary, I mean, I think it's really, really hard to work hard. It's really important to work hard for long periods of time, but I think the most important thing at the end of that process is to be able to go out and have a few beers with your friends. Thank you.